The biggest advantage of an ultra short throw projector over a standard projector is the ability to use specialized ALR and CLR projection screens that block out ambient light, allowing you to watch your projector during the day with the blinds open and the lights on. But the big question is whether a $400 CLR screen performs just as well as a $1,400 one. So to answer that, I've gathered eight popular screens from all different price ranges to see exactly what the difference is. In this video, we'll test their construction quality, screen gain, black floor, ambient light rejection from different light sources, microscopic structure, and finally we'll do some side-by-side -side testing with both a standard brightness projector and an abnormally bright one. For a price of $450, the least expensive screen we're gonna be testing is this 100-inch lenticular CLR screen from Wemax. A lenticular screen has a microscopic sawtooth structure with a flat light-absorbing layer on the top and a reflective angled layer underneath, which results in the reflection of light coming from below the screen and rejection of light coming from above it. We specifically call these ceiling light rejection or CLR screens because they do a much better job blocking light from ceiling mounted light sources rather than floor lamps or windows. The WeMax frame is made of aluminum and is produced with acceptable tolerances resulting in slight gaps in the mitered corners, but the construction materials result in a strong and sturdy frame that's easy to assemble. The screen material itself is installed in tension using fiberglass tension rods and springs that attach to the aluminum frame. The WeMax screen took me about one and a half hours to construct using the included instructions and I had no issues getting proper tension on the screen. Next for $499 is this 103 inch screen from Akia Screens, which is a sister company of Elite Screens. This screen uses their CLR2 material, which in addition to a lenticular sawtooth design is also coated in a scratch resistant coating, which allows for much easier cleaning. Unlike the rest of the CLR screens that I'll be testing, the CLR2 is able to be used with ultra short throw projectors and short throw projectors. The IKEA screen frame material was significantly less sturdy than the WeMax and the instructions were not as easy to follow. The screen material itself also had a very strong chemical smell that reminded me of PVC pipe cement and that smell took a few days to dissipate. The screen material is attached to the frame using springs, but instead of fiberglass tensioning rods, the IKEA screen used metal grommets, and unlike the WeMax screen, the springs didn't slot into the frame and felt a little bit cheap. But the tensioning instructions were clear and I was able to get the screen properly tensioned with no waves or creases on the first try. The IKEA screen took about two hours to build. After that, for $686 plus shipping is this 100 inch lenticular CLR screen from Nothing Projector. The Nothing Projector frame was identical to the WeMax frame, which as I mentioned before, was both sturdy and easy to assemble. Just like the WeMax, the screen material is installed and tensioned using fiberglass tension rods and springs that attach to the aluminum frame. In addition to a convenient spring design that has a separate loop for a spring puller, the frame also includes two different slots for attaching the spring, which allows you to apply more tension if needed. Just like the WeMax and IKEA screens, the instructions for tensioning had a clear spring attachment order, which allowed me to easily get the screen tensioned without any wrinkles or ripples. The smell from the Nothing Projector screen was very mild compared to the IKEA screen. The construction of the Nothing Projector screen took me approximately one and a half hours. Next, coming in just under $1,000 is this new 100-inch Fresnel ALR screen from 4Movie. Unlike the lenticular CLR screens that we've seen so far, the 4Movie is a Fresnel design that uses a series of ridged concentric circles starting from the bottom middle of the screen. We call Fresnel screens ambient light rejecting screens or ALR instead of CLR because they reject any light that doesn't originate from the center bottom of the screen. So they're effective at blocking both ceiling light and parallel ambient light sources. Sources. Fresnel screens also focus light specifically back at the viewer, which results in a brighter picture for anyone sitting directly in front of the screen, but significantly worse off axis viewing. The 4Movie screen had clear, easy to follow instructions and a lightweight but high quality aluminum frame. Unlike the rest of the screens, the 4Movie screen material is tensioned using screws with fiberglass tension rods, which are so much easier to use than springs, and there was absolutely no doubt that the screen would be perfectly tensioned and wrinkle-free. The 4Movie screen material did have a noticeable smell that reminded me a lot of a newly purchased inflatable raft. The 4Movie build time was the least yet, at just an hour and 15 minutes, and it was by far the easiest screen to put together. Last for a price of $1,299 is the most expensive fixed frame screen that we'll be testing, the 100 inch Spectra Vantage CLR screen. Like the WeMax and the Nothing Projector screens, the Vantage CLR is a lenticular sawtooth design without a protective coating and it's specifically designed for ultra short throw projectors. 
The frame material for the Spectre Vantage is extremely heavy duty compared to the rest of the screens, resulting in a frame that is built like a tank and looks and feels premium. Unfortunately, the instructions for the Spectre Vantage were the worst of the screens that I tested, and they had pictures that were too small to be helpful and confusingly worded steps, and even a picture that didn't correspond to the frame that I was putting together, causing me to go searching in the box for a part that I thought was missing, but turned out wasn't needed or included. The screen material on the Spectre Vantage was noticeably thicker than the rest of the screens that I put together, but the attachment method was the same using fiberglass tension rods and springs that attach to the frame. Unfortunately, the instructions also failed me on this step. Unlike the numbered tensioning diagrams for the other screen, the Spectre instructions just say start from the middle and connect the corner springs using the pull hook. Like what middle? Do I do one side and then the other? Middle springs, then corners, then the rest? The Spectre screen also includes a few special heavy duty springs that the instructions say can help you get rid of wrinkles, but there isn't any information about where to put them in relation to the wrinkle to fix the problem. And the reason I'm telling you all of this is that despite being easily the highest quality frame with the best materials and best manufacturing tolerances, the Spectra screen was the only one that I couldn't get perfectly tensioned. And I'm not saying it can't be done, but I spent nearly twice as long as the rest of the screens for a total of three hours assembling and trying to get all the wrinkles out of the corners of the Spectra screen, and I ultimately never got them perfectly flat. Okay, stop. For full transparency, what you just heard was my original script for this video that I finished writing on Thursday, March 3rd. And I want you to know that every review that you see on this channel is completely unbiased and unsponsored. But after building the Spectre screen and testing it, something didn't seem right. I do a ton of research before making these videos, and the Spectre Vantage is almost universally praised as being one of, if not the most premium ultra short throw projector screen that you can buy. But in my testing, it was just not good. Here's a raw clip of the first time I saw a projected image on the Vantage. And pure so, energy. Yeah, black holes. Energy that is about to reveal good. an entire universe of color. So I contacted Brian over at projectorscreen.com and he was just as confused as me. We exchanged measurements, compared them side by side to other screens we had on hand, and something was clearly wrong with my screen. Brian overnighted me some material from one of his floor samples and sure enough, they were completely different. You can see the old screen on the left and the retest on the right. Not only is there a night and day difference in ambient light rejection, gain, and black levels, but the replacement screen tensioned very easily without any wrinkles. I don't want to speak for Brian or projectorscreen.com, but the cliff's notes of our conversation was that in January, his supplier substituted a material without telling him and a batch of screens, including mine, were affected. So if you own a recently ordered Spectre screen or are concerned about the quality of your Spectre screen moving forward, I highly recommend checking out the video call that I had with Brian that I linked down in the description. But for the remainder of this video, I have reshot all the footage containing the Spectre screen and moving forward, all references to the Spectre will be the replacement screen. All right, back to the original script. The last three screens came without any drama and no assembly required. First, for $1,350 plus shipping, we've got the Vivid Storm S Pro 100 inch floor rising CLR screen, which has the lenticular sawtooth design. Floor rising screens use articulating tension arms on the back of the screen and tab tension edges to quickly roll up and down at the touch of a button. These screens are great if you have a convertible home theater and they allow you to have a giant viewing experience when you want it without needing to dedicate an entire wall to your screen. The Vivid Storm comes with an RF remote and also has on-unit controls for raising and lowering the screen. The 100 inch Vivid Storm screen has a rolled away size of 96 by 6 by 4 and a half inches, making it the most compact of the three floor rising screens that I'll be testing. For $1,479 plus shipping is the Nothing Projector 100 inch floor rising CLR screen. Like the Vivid Storm, the Nothing Projector screen is a lenticular CLR design and uses articulating tension arms on the back of the screen combined with tab tensioning on the outsides to create a rolling screen without wrinkles or creases. The Nothing Projector floor rising screen is two inches wider than the Vivid Storm for a total size of 98 by six and a quarter by four and a half inches and the Nothing Projector screen also comes with a remote in addition to having on-unit controls. And last, the most expensive screen that we'll be testing is the $2016 Elite Screens Kestrel Tab Tension 2 CLR3 Series 100 inch floor rising screen. As I mentioned, IKEA and Elite Screens are sister companies, so they also offer this CLR3 material in a fixed frame and the CLR2 material in floor rising varieties. Unlike the IKEA CLR2, the CLR3 screen doesn't have that additional protective coating on top of its lenticular design, and it's only meant for ultra short throw projectors. The Elite Floor Rising screen comes with a remote and has on unit controls, and in addition to being the most expensive screen, the Elite Floor Rising screen is also the largest at 98 by 6 by 5.5 inches. Screen gain is a measurement of how much of the projector's light gets reflected back at the viewer, and it's measured from a zero degree viewing angle at the brightest portion of the screen. 
Since higher gain screens reflect more projected light to your eyes, they produce a brighter overall image, but using a lower gain screen will improve contrast and black levels of your projector. In general, you should pair a high lumen projector with a low gain screen and a low lumen projector with a high gain screen to get the most vivid image, best contrast, and best black levels. To get a baseline value for gain, I used a 1.0 gain screen material from VividStorm combined with a pure white image projected from the 4Movie Theater Ultra Short Throw Projector. Measured using my Lux meter with a directional attachment, the 1.0 gain screen gave a value of 19.4 lux at a distance of 1 meter. I repeated these exact same steps for each screen material and the results were pretty odd in that they didn't closely correspond with the values listed on their manufacturer websites. I found that the brightest screen by far was the 4Movie Fresnel screen which I measured at 1.54 gain compared to its listed gain of 1.0. The Elite CLR3 material is supposed to have a gain of 0.8 versus the 0.9 on the CLR2, but I found that the CLR3 had a significantly brighter image and I measured the gain at 0.97 while the CLR2 had a measured gain of 0.8. Of the screens that listed a 0.6 gain, the Nothing projector screen was the brightest with a measured gain of 0.8, followed by the VividStorm at 0.8. 0.74, and then the Wemax at 0.69. The replacement Spectre screen was listed at 0.5 gain, but I found that it was about the same as the other screens at 0.77. Another important measurement is the black floor, which is how much light gets reflected back when the projector shines an all-black screen. Generally speaking, the higher the gain, the higher the black floor will be, meaning blacks won't be as black. Using the same testing methodology, but projecting a black screen instead of a white screen, I found that the black floor of the white calibrating screen was the highest at 0.06 lux, followed by the IKEA at 0.05 lux. Then it was the Nothing Fluorizing screen at 0.04 lux, then the Elite, VividStorm, and Wemax at 0.03, then the Nothing Projector Fixed Frame and 4Movie Fresnel were at 0.02 lux, and the lowest black floor was the Spectre Vantage at 0.01. Gain and black floor are common measurements for any projector screen, but the main selling point of these screens specifically is their ability to exclude ambient light, specifically from ceiling light sources. So to test that ability, I used two banks of diffused LED lighting, one bank at a 45 degree angle from the center of the screen, and another at a 15 degree angle. And again, I calibrated the measurement using that 1.0 gain non-ALR screen sample. Starting with that 15 degree angle light, which would be similar to having ceiling lighting over your couch, the Elite CLR3 screen material rejected 49% of that ambient light. Then it was the IKEA CLR2 with 51%. The Spectra, VividStorm, and Nothing Projector Fluorizing all rejected 60% of ambient light from 15 degrees. The Nothing Projector Fixed Frame rejected 62%. After that, the least expensive screen, the Wemax, rejected 64%, and then the highest light rejection value came from the 4Movie Fresnel screen at 70%. Moving on to a much steeper 45 degree ambient light angle, the pure CLR screens improved significantly, with the IKEA CLR2 screen performing the worst at 62% rejection, then the Elite CLR3 at 70%, the Wemax at 72%, the 4Movie at 76%, the Spectre at 78, and then the VividStorm, Nothing Projector Fluorizing Screen, and Nothing Projector Fixed Frame Screen all had 80% rejection of light at a 45 degree angle. So from a pure light performance standpoint, we would expect the best performing screen to be the 4Movie Fresnel screen, which had the highest gain, lowest black floor, best ambient light rejection at 15 degrees, and was only 4% away from the best light rejection at 45 degrees. But the problem with Fresnel screens is that they're designed for a very narrow viewing angle of about 45 to 50 degrees. And off-center viewing will result in hot spots and dim areas that you won't get with a lenticular CLR screen. The highest performing lenticular screen on paper is the Nothing Projector screen, with a gain of 0.8, a black floor of 0.2 lumens, 62% rejection of 15 degree ambient light and 80% rejection of 45 degree ceiling light. However, it's not all about light performance and the ability to clearly resolve every pixel of an image is a reason I often see cited as a justification for a higher price screen. Using a microscope, I examine each screen structure at six different points to get a representative image of the microscopic structure. The first thing to notice is that all the screens, regardless of the price, have the same number of sawtooth ridges. I counted 36 ridges per centimeter, so for a 100 inch diagonal screen, which is 49 inches or 124.5 centimeters tall, there would be 4,482 horizontal ridges, which is more than sufficient for the 2,160 horizontal pixels in a 4K screen, and even enough for the 4,320 horizontal pixels of an 8K screen. However, looking at their microscopic structure, there definitely does seem to be a correlation between price and the uniformity of the sawtooth structure. The cheapest screen from Wemax looks fuzzy and deformed, while the Spectra has straight, rigid lines that could theoretically help it reproduce images more accurately. 
I also thought the variation in sawtooth pitch and the ratio of dark to light areas was interesting, but ultimately I couldn't find any correlation between that and my light performance data. Missing from this figure are the IKEA CLR2 screens and the Formovie Fresnel screens, which look completely different under a microscope due to their reflective coatings. But you can still get a feeling for how the CLR2 screen has the same horizontal lenticular pattern versus the Formovie that has its varying concentric circles based on where I placed the microscope. All right, I love quantitative data more than anyone I know, but ultimately these numbers don't mean any anything unless they translate to a better viewing experience. So to test that, I set up each projector side by side and projected a 100 inch image split between the two screens. To be able to more easily compare the screens, I edited the Dolby Atmos Nature's Fury test video to split it down the middle with one side as a mirror image of the other, meaning that light colors and contrast will be right next to each other on both screens. I tested in 15 degree ambient light, 45 degree ambient light and total darkness and I ran each of the tests with the two best performing ultra short throw projectors from my 2022 showdown. The Four Movie Theater, which is somewhere in the ballpark of 2,200 antilumens, and the AWOL LTV3500, which is somewhere around 3,300 antilumens, based on my personal testing. Starting with the $450 WiMAX on the left and the $499 IKEA screen on the right, with the 15 degree ambient light, even before the image shows up on the screen, you can see that the WiMAX is noticeably darker than the Akita, meaning the WiMAX should have better contrast and black levels. And sure enough, while the image from the Four Movie isn't exactly great on either screen, it is much better on the WiMAX. Unfortunately for the IKEA screen, the same trend played out with every light source and every projector, and it was even apparent in a room with nearly zero ambient light where you would expect the higher gain screen to perform better, but the colors just looked muted and washed out in the IKEA in every situation. The IKEA also had unexpectedly poor off-axis performance with hot spotting on the near side and a noticeably dim area on the far side, so the WiMAX easily took this round. That means that in round two, we've got the $450 WiMAX on the left and the $696 nothing projector screen on the right. And the ambient light black floor difference was even more severe than it was in the previous round, this time with the nothing projector screen with the higher contrast and better black levels in almost all conditions. For the 45 degree ambient light test and the zero ambient light test, the nothing projector screen had blacker blacks and whiter whites. But in the 15 degree ambient light test, the WiMAX actually had a better black floor due to the fact that it was the lowest gain projector screen that I tested. Unfortunately, this also meant that that its overall luminance was lower, which was more apparent using the Four Movie Theater than it was with the super bright AWOL. Off-axis performance was equal between the two, and both offer the super wide viewing angles that lenticular CLR screens are known for. If your room has more diffuse ambient light and your projector is sufficiently bright, then the WiMAX screen might be a good choice. But in most situations, the nothing projector screen performed better, so it's gonna move on to the next round. And this next round is a little bit tricky because it should be the nothing projector screen on the right versus the four movie Fresnel screen on the left. But the design of this test makes that impossible since the Fresnel screen blocks out any light that doesn't come from the bottom middle of the screen. So for this round, I tested each screen individually and then I cut and flipped the images in Adobe Premiere. And with the four movie screen set up properly, it significantly outperformed the nothing projector screen in both 15 degree diffuse light and the zero ambient light test. And in the 45 degree ambient light test, the results were confusing. The nothing projector clearly has a better black level and rejects more ambient light. But you can see that the lenticular design also has a noticeable gradient of reflected light with the bottom of the screen having much better black levels while the four movie screen looks more gray but the black levels are uniform throughout the whole screen. So in most conditions, the four movie screen was significantly better as long as you're watching within a 45 degree cone. But off axis, the four movie Fresnel screen was significantly worse. So I'm gonna move the nothing projector screen on so I can compare lenticular screens to lenticular screens, but I'm pretty convinced that Fresnel screens are the future of UST projector screens as long as extreme viewing angles aren't important in your space. So that means that on the left, we've got the $696 nothing projector screen, and on the right is the $1,299 Spectre Vantage. And with all the lights off, I could barely tell any difference between them, except maybe slightly higher color saturation on the Spectre and very slightly more contrast, but I'd mostly call it a tie. However, in the diffuse 15 degree ambient light, the black levels on the Spectre were noticeably better without any corresponding loss in luminance. And I even think that the white levels might've been slightly whiter on the Spectre as seen here. With the 45 degree light source, the outcome was the same with the Spectra screen achieving slightly higher contrast due to its lower black floor and off axis, both the screens performed well as far as image uniformity, but the Spectra had a more noticeable reduction in brightness. So overall, I do think that the Spectra screen has a slight edge over the nothing projector screen in terms of black level and general performance, but whether it's $600 better is a decision you're ultimately gonna need to make for yourself. And I think both screens are very good. When testing the floor rising screens, I attempted the same side-by-side -side comparison, but the housing of the floor rising mechanism 
mechanism made it impossible to butt the screens together. So I found it was more useful to use the single screen footage and mirror them in Premiere. So on the left is the $1,479 Nothing Projector Floor Rising Screen, and on the right is the $1,350 VividStorm S Pro Floor Rising Screen. And these screens are basically identical in performance, both on paper and in practice. I couldn't see any significant difference between picture quality in any of the ambient light conditions, and off-axis, both of the screens performed well with no hotspots or dim areas. The only notable difference between the two screens are that the housing of the Nothing Projector screen is two inches wider, the VividStorm screen has more tabs on the sides which could possibly lead to less wrinkling, and the Nothing Projector fluorizing screen appears to have at least one more backing layer, causing it to be significantly better at blocking out light coming from behind the screen, which could be important if you're planning on putting your fluorizing screen in front of a window. But as far as black levels, gain, and ambient light rejection, I don't see any difference between these two screens. So we'll call that round a tie and put the $1,479 Nothing Projector Fluorizing screen on the left and the $2,016 Elite Screen CLR3 Fluorizing screen on the right. And these materials are clearly significantly different from one another. You can see that during the zero ambient light testing, the CLR3 material in the Elite screen looks much brighter due to its measured gain of 0.97, but that significantly hindered its performance in both the 15 degree ambient light testing where it had noticeably worse black levels and lower contrast and the 45 degree ambient light testing where the CLR3 material looked completely washed out. Off axis, both screens perform well, but you can see that the higher gain of the Elite CLR3 screen material makes the image look significantly brighter in a zero ambient light environment. That means that for ambient light performance, the best value screen is the VividStorm 100-inch S Pro since it performed identically to the Nothing Projectors floor rising screen, but costs over $100 less. So last, let's compare the overall winner in the fixed frame category, the Spectra Vantage 100-inch on the left, to the top recommendation floor rising screen, the VividStorm S Pro on the right. In a zero ambient light environment, there is no noticeable difference between the two, but in 15 degree ambient light, the lower black floor or the Spectra Vantage leads to better black levels and better contrast. And the same is true in the 45 degree ambient light environment. But overall, the best performing screen given a viewing area of less than 45 degrees was by far the 4Movie Fresnel ALR screen that looked amazing in basically every lighting condition. Paired with a 3300 ANSI Lumen AWOL LTV3500, the 4Movie screen gave a TV-like watching experience even in my garage workshop with all 160 watts of LED lighting on. And honestly, it is the most impressive image that I have ever seen from any projector and screen combo, including all the displays that I saw at CES this year. The other interesting thing about a Fresnel screen is that if you wanted to mount your projector on the ceiling, you could flip your screen upside down and it would still provide ambient light rejection since it blocks any light that doesn't originate from the center of the screen. Unlike the other Fresnel screens that I've seen, the 4Movie doesn't have the hot spotting or ceiling reflections that have typically been associated with Fresnel technology, and I cannot wait until it's available in a fluorizing form factor so I can add it to my setup. I've got links down in the description for the top performing 4Movie screen, as well as all the other screens that I tested in this video, and even though, as always, this is a completely unsponsored and unbiased review, those are affiliate links, so if you appreciate the time, effort, and money that it takes me to make a video like this, I'd love it if you could use those links since I do earn a small commission on the sale at no cost to you. I'd also like to thank all of my awesome patrons over at Patreon for their continued support of my channel. And if you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out the links down in the description. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that thumbs up button and consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching The Hookup.